I do love that they start with the fire alarm because that's a part of the whole um, event that comes to be known as the Boston Massacre that is so often forgotten that there's actually a calling, speaking of mob mentality, of a group of people to gather um, with a really ever-present fear in the 18th century of fire and that fear is really easily transferable. Perhaps second only to smallpox or something yes. like that. I, I don't know, perhaps they're, they're equal as far as uh, the level of fear goes. It's that fear of fire that prompts somebody like Benjamin Franklin to start up fire insurance in places yes. like Philadelphia a few years pr prior to this. Well, and there's no real public service of, um, you know, you know the fire company is gonna come and help you. You are required to have fire buckets, at least I know in Virginia, they were required to have fire buckets within their house. Um, in Virginia, they started requiring to have chimneys of brick, but like, it's not equally um, applied across all demographics, so there's still that really f great fear. With this depiction of the Boston Massacre, uh, you know, not everything's perfect. You know, the, the uniforms of the British soldiers is off a bit. Yeah. But right out of the gate, you already have a sense of empathy a little bit for the British soldiers, perhaps more so than what your common American would otherwise have, a kind of school book oh, interpretation. Uh, but if you want to see a really good visual representation of the Boston Massacre, artist Don Troiani did oh. a top-notch painting showing this event unfold, and this is a guy who really does his homework. Check him out on Facebook. He posts a lot of stuff. Um, fantastic historical artist. Sam, come away! You'll suffer the full mercy of the law! Sam! These people need to be tended to. These people need our help, Sam. Yes? One of the things that the series does is that it sometimes places John Adams in places and <laughs> moments and events where he wasn't actually there. This is true. Um, is that the case here? Or does his proximity to this was he a witness to the immediate aftermath of the Boston Massacre? Or is that up to speculation? I believe it's up to speculation. Um, I have never seen, and I am not a expert on John Adams, so I don't want to speak out of turn, but I've never seen a primary source that puts him at the massacre itself. Um, and there's lots of lists of people who were there. Um, but uh, I can imagine that it would have felt very immediate to him being within his community and with uh, people that he surely uh, rubbed shoulders with. What happened, Father? We looked, but we well, didn't see the fire. Well, it's all over now. It's just a little hubbub. Nothing to worry about. Return to bed. This interaction between the Adams family makes me think about how we present modern events as they unfold to our families. I mean, he's saying, you know, it's just a little hubbub, don't worry about it. And we look back at this event and it is, it is the touchstone that touches off every event that comes after it. And so uh, it, it's interesting to see from a family perspective how you present these ideas to children. These are the murderers. God forgive them. Oh, we're in Williamsburg right now, um, in an actual original jail that held um, uh, Loyalist supporters and a lot of enslaved people that were owned by Loyalist supporters, uh, which is, in my mind, one of the tragedies is that they were seized as property put in this jail, um, which becomes the set for John Adams many, many years later. Um, and a lot of those enslaved people were set to work in the lead mines, which is a death sentence in itself, simply by being, for being owned um, by the wrong person. That some of your soldiers did fire Captain Preston. 
As of this morning, five are dead, men and boys. No man acted in self-defense, Mr. Adams. As God Almighty is our judge. Adams mentions five men dying, but as of the moment that he's meeting with the characters here, uh, only three yes. had, had died. Um, one died shortly thereafter, and one died about two weeks later, yes. succumbing to his wounds. You have much of a case, John. Do I not? No Boston jury will ever vote for acquittal. Uh, this is not a time for showing how clever you are, cousin. This is a time for choosing sides. I am for the law, cousin. Is there another side? The, I, the idea that you have to choose a side is um, starting to become really prevalent in Massachusetts at this time. You've got people who are, there's a story in the paper about a woman whose husband is loyalist and she and her daughter are dragged out of their house in the middle of the night. Um, and so the threat of your political leanings extends to your family members and sometimes being perceived to be one way or another is enough to have a threat made against your family. Um, so it's not just that one moment of the Boston Massacre where there's sort of mob mentality going on. Uh, Mr. Gutter, where exactly were you standing when you say you heard the officer in the dock, Captain Preston, give the order to fire? Close enough to have touched him, sir. Mm. And where was he standing? He stood behind his men, sir. So... <laughs> I see, I see. There's a lot of different ways to dissect the courtroom scene um, because contrary to what we see in the film, there are actually two separate trials. Mm -hmm. There's one for Prescott and then there is one for the enlisted men who were under his command. Uh, and you really get a sense here that this trial happens almost immediately. You know, it's still winter time out, you know, people still have the wounds on their faces. Uh, Private Montgomery still has the cut on him, uh, but in reality, Prescott's trial was the following October, mm -hmm. and then that of his enlisted men was the following month in November. Um, and so, as is the case in historical miniseries, you have things being greatly condensed. The other interesting part here is with uh, Cousin Sam up from the balcony on high yelling his views. The the series presents this idea that, the, speaking to the division that was very much apparent in many families in 1770, that there's a wedge being driven between these two cousins who otherwise see eye to eye on a lot of issues. Uh, but in reality, uh, Sam wanted John to take the trial because he would bring a degree of prestige and nobility to the proceedings. Um, they wanted to give the presentation that these guys were getting a fair trial and it was a right. good upstanding guy who was acting as their legal representation. And um, in so doing, the film also leaves out another really um, interesting character, and that is Josiah Quincy, who's yes. another cousin in the mix here, uh, who was John Adams' co-counsel. Uh, and so, uh, you know, once again, things being a little bit simplified, but in, in the name of time, Holmes, would you please describe the events you witnessed on the night of March the 5th? I saw some boys near the sentry at the custom house door. They were shouting? Yes. Uh, what, what were they shouting to the soldiers? Just before the soldiers started shooting. Yes? I heard the people say, To be a, a black man or woman, free or enslaved, um, in the 18th century is to be in a precarious position no matter what you're doing. And so I think that it's, um, I don't know Massachusetts law as well as I know Virginia law, but I do know in Virginia, black men and women were not allowed to testify in a court of law. In fact, mm -hmm. um, George Wythe, one of the signers of the declaration, was poisoned by his nephew and his black, free black cook saw it and 
it, he wasn't able to be mm. prosecuted. So all that being said, um, to be questioned about these events, uh, you have to not just give the truth, but you have to give the right truth, if that makes sense. On the charge of murder, we, the jury, find the accused, Captain Thomas Preston, not guilty. <laughs> we, the jury, find the accused, John Carroll, James Hardigan, Matthew Kilroy, William McCauley, Hugh Montgomery, William Warren, William Waynes, and Hugh White. Not guilty. I believe a couple of the soldiers were indeed found guilty and then um, Montgomery and Kilroy yes, were, yeah, you know, they were slaughter. burned in the in the hand which essentially it's more than a um, physical punishment you have a you have a branding iron that would burn you right on the thumb pad but part of english law states that after you've gotten burned in the hand you're not allowed to um, testify in court oh, wow. you lose your legal abilities hmm. and so it strips you of a lot of the court's protections hmm. and puts you in some ways outside of the law's protection um, so not necessarily not guilty. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. it is a bigger punishment than those um, seconds of pain while you've got the um, the hot iron to your hand. Mm -hmm. and Montgomery was uh, the the sentinel who was the initial guard who yes. was who was uh, present by yes. himself. Yeah, so it's interesting that that he was brought up on manslaughter charges. I, I don't love to dabble in um, the what ifs of history, but I do think it's important to point out that. Uh, I think that if Massachusetts had chosen to hang these men in this moment, it wouldn't have just alienated the um, British government. But I also think that this, the sister colonies would have felt like that was a step too far. And it would have been a lot harder to convince colonies like Virginia and the Carolinas to come to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not sure how much Adams knew that that was at stake when mm. he was arguing this case, mm -hmm. but that is a very real pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, sometimes it's better to play the victim card than the aggressor yes. card. So, yes. Yes. Yeah.